Hey, thanks for having me, Dave. So, Armand, uh, a couple things we wanted to just talk with you about. Uh, I've read with you know a lot of interest your review of uh, of Django and Chain, the newest film by Quentin Tarantino. The title of the review is still not a brother. It's available at cityarts.info. Uh, and I kind of want to talk about some of the things you said in this review, uh, but I guess I think the best place to start is just to ask you what you thought of Django Unchained as a whole. Did you like it or did you not like it? Uh, absolutely did not like it, uh, which, which, is, which, which tends to be my response to Tarantino's work. I don't, I don't like what he does. And so this this film is no different from the others. Um, well, maybe I should say I, I I did at the time in 1992 I did like Reservoir Dogs, but have come to have reservations about it. But I haven't liked any of his films since then, for sure. And with this one, I you know it's what he usually does, which is simply, in my view, to uh, to make hash of genres. And also in this case, as with Inglorious Bastards, to make hash of history. So, you know, I, I, I couldn't like it. I couldn't enjoy it simply as a film, as if we ever do enjoy films simply as films. And I certainly did not enjoy it as a as a take on American history. So it simply did not work for me. Well, you write here about Samuel L. Jackson's character. Uh, I'm going to just read from your review, if, uh, if you don't mind. In Django Unchained, Jackson is to Tarantino what Step and Fetch It was to John Ford, the actor who perf- personifies his director's sense of the other. And I'm going to skip forward here. Uh, Jackson reverses the anger that 70s black militants felt toward the Uncle Tom figure into an actorly endorsement. He embodies the dangerous Negro stereotypes harbored by Tarantino and every Huck Finn wannabe. Uh, so, you th- and you think that that is a, a bad thing, that, that Jackson is embodying these stereotypes, correct? Well, sure. Uh, not much differently from what Sam Jackson typically does. Um, he all, all, to me, he always is representative of a. He always he's always a neg- negative representative of African American men, and so in that sense, this is no different. But this is a little more interesting because uh, with Tarantino, they've they've kind of gone back to the ultimate uh, disreputable black American male, who is the Uncle Tom figure that originated in Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel Uncle Tom's Cabin. Which was which was a a work of abolitionist sentiment. It was a novel written to inspire people to protest slavery, to end slavery. And so now we take the Uncle Tom figure, uh, who who is who is a figure who who does things to please and approve his slave master. Uh, that figure has become a a figure of ridicule in in modern times, especially during the 1960s uh, civil rights movement and and black militant movement. And since then, uh, that figure has kind of receded in our culture, but Tarantino and Sam Jackson bring him back as another figure, of, a negative figure of, of, of black malehood. And, but they do, they do a kind of perverse twist on it. They make him a, a comic, satirical character, and still all the same, a, a kind of a negative figure. Um, what did you... Uh... I, I guess I'm curious. Uh, are you sort of categorically opposed to uh, rendering history in a way that both kind of plays with these archetypes and also, you know, it, what Tarantino has done? He's he's kind of inserted this this Western feel um, and this kind of action movie feel at points into into Django Unchained and, and kind of has done that with the backdrop of history. Are you categorically opposed to that practice in general or just the way Tarantino does it? Well, I couldn't be opposed to it in general because I've, it's been done before and done well before. I guess I am, and you know, not, the term categorically suggests that I'm against it uh, before even looking at it. No, that's not the case. Uh, I, I, go to, I went to Django Unchained like I go to every movie, uh, waiting to see what it is. Uh, unfortunately, with, with Tarantino, it turns out to be exactly what he always does. So I wasn't against it ahead of time. I was against it. As, I, I came, became. I went against it as I watched it. Uh, dealing with historical stereotypes, dealing with uh, genre tropes. Uh, lots of movies have done that. 
In fact, as I watched Django Unchained, one film particularly came to mind all the time, which was a 1971 film by, I believe, Paul, a director named Paul Bogart called Skin Game, uh, which, which starred uh, uh, Louis Gossett Jr. And it was about a, a white man and his and a freed black man uh, in the pre-Civil War days uh, who posed as a, they were a con man team where uh, they posed as master and slave and they went around conning people. And I, I kind of thought that since Tarantino always refers to other movies as if he's seen every movie that's ever been made, I was expecting him at some point to reference Skin Game. But he never did because he has different aims than the aims of the makers of Skin Game. He, Skin Game, I think, was a satire uh, that took the horrors of slavery seriously. Uh, I think Tarantino has made a, has, I guess, I guess made a satire that does not take the horrors of slavery seriously. I think he simply takes the horrors of slavery, its, its violence and cruelty, just as an opportunity to be violent and cruel in his sadistic, juvenile way. How do you so? I guess how do you intuit his his aims there? Like, why, why do you think that he doesn't take it seriously? And also, like, what what are your other objections to the film? If um, if you if you're not opposed to that kind of satirical take, like, what, why where do you think Django falls short of of rising to the level of a film like Skin Game? Well, um, I think I think for instance, the Samuel Jackson Uncle Tom figure. I think is a satirical figure, and there are scenes in the movie that are obviously intended to be comic moments. For me, uh, that in itself isn't enough. Uh, the joke has to be a good joke. The joke has to work. I know, I know, humor is personal, <laughs> but uh, those jokes didn't work for me here. Uh, it's kind of as simple as that. Uh, his Tarantino's attempt to make a, a satire didn't work for me. But then also, uh, I can't, I can't, I won't forget the fact that he's dealing with serious history, and his approach to it I found offensive, and uh, so that makes me not like it as well. It's not that you can't do these things. That's why I bring up the example of Skin Game. You can, you can make a satire even about slavery, the slavery era, but you have to do it with some intelligence, some genuine wit, and most importantly, I think, with with some human feeling, with, with humane feeling, uh, not the kind of sadism that Tarantino specializes in. All right. Uh, I, mean, I, mean, you know, I mean, he might, he, you know, he, he might as well be a slave master. He might as well be Simon Legree for the way that he likes to uh, employ the whip on his audience and on his characters. Um, I, that's kind of... Uh all the questions I had about Django and Chain, Devinder and Adam, if you have anything, feel free, feel free to chime in. But um, I, I, mm-hmm. I know I know our time is short, and I also have some stuff to talk to you about Zero Dark Thirty as well. Uh, I was actually curious. Uh, what are what are your views on Blazing Saddles, for example? Uh, same thing, same thing. I, I guess I probably could have used the Blazing Saddles example, except that I prefer <laughs> Skin Game. Do you guys know Skin Game, by the way? No, no unfortunately, no, not familiar. Yep. You, you, you should seriously, you should seriously check it out. It's, mm-hmm. it's quite a good comedy. I, be, I believe the co-stars were uh, Louis Gossett and James Garner, I think. And it's good comedy. It's, it, it, it shows what Tarantino can't do, or rather, what he doesn't do in this film. <laughs> Uh, and a better a better example, I think, than than Blazing Saddles, uh, because Mel Brooks is a genuine hum- humorist. Mel Brooks, I guess, you have to say, is also a humanist. Uh, he doesn't go in for cruelty. Uh, he he's not cruel like Tarantino. Tarantino is a, a cruel filmmaker. Uh, that can't be. I think that cannot be ignored, even by people who profess to enjoy his work. No, actually, I, I would actually say that's totally valid. Um, but I would also say that I think there's sort of a, a juxtaposition between something like Blazing Saddles, which is a lot more good-natured, and Django Unchained, which does have this sadistic streak. And I think the fact that it's not played too seriously almost makes the history feel that more that much more repellent when you actually take like everything that's happened throughout American history and taking this just really dark time in, in our past. I feel like something about the way Django Unchained plays that um, – draws attention to that fact, the way it is so sadistic. Do you not feel that at all? I would have to argue against that. I, but, uh, you know, like I said before, humor is personal. And I think to uh, to accept 
the approach of Django Unchained has to do with one's own personal approach to history. Um, you know, I'm a black man. <laughs> and so, you know, I have, a, I have a response to slavery that some other people might not have. But, but I also at the same time have to say, I'm not Jewish, but I felt the same thing about Inglorious Bastards. I thought the Holocaust was no fun. And, and I, I felt offended at watching it being used as, a, as an opportunity for jokes and, and jokey sadism. Um, I think it's a matter of how much one knows about history, how much you care about a particular moment in history, and how much you respect the past. Well, the thing is, here's the thing, uh, Armand, is that, um, again, I can't, we're, uh, obviously your reaction is, is your reaction, and, and uh, there's nothing we would do to, to – everyone's reaction to film is personal. Uh, yeah. We did get an email from a Slash Filmcast listener, Robert, who wrote the following. Um, I just heard your review of Django and wanted to throw in my two cents. As a black male, I was totally moved by so many scenes in Django. I had almost a visceral reaction to the scene where Django whips one of the brothers in the early part of the movie. The revenge fantasy element was awesome in that it was in some ways so empowering from the slave films we have been presented with in the past. Um, so, I just got a, is, that, are you, is that end of quote? Uh, that's end of. That's end, I mean, it goes on, but that's that's the you know that that there are some people. The point is that there are some uh, some black males who or you know black females that may watch this movie and feel empowered by it. Uh, what what is kind of your reaction to that? Well, well, my, my first reaction is exactly what films have you seen before? <laughs> what, what films is he, is he talking about? I don't think he could have. This person could have seen very many. Uh, and as far as empowerment goes. There, there, there is a fact about contemporary film culture, I think, that needs to be faced, but people don't like to face it. And that fact is that, uh, oh, for the past 20 years or so, that the movie-going audience has been debased, that the movie-going audience uh, has been made accustomed to uh, juvenile points of view, uh, historical and social ignorance, uh, warped ideas about politics and humanity and morality. Uh, I, I believe this is a fact, and I think I can prove it by the number of really immoral and ignorant films that become popular. When somebody says they feel empowered by a movie like Django Unchained, I'm, I'm sad for them. Because where is the empowerment? Particularly, where is the empowerment when, when the, narrative, the narrative drive is... I mean, where is the empowerment for a black person when the narrative drive is given to a white character, a white character very cruelly named Dr. King. Uh, <laughs> to say you're empowered by that, I think, is just plain ignorant. Interesting. Yeah. Well, first of all, let's, let's not impugn our listener. I'm, I'm sure Robert will listen oh, to well, I'm not. Well, I'm, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know your listener. I don't even know his name, so I'm not impugning right. any particular listener. I am trying to get an ignorant response to reverse itself and become more thoughtful. <laughs> well, I'm sure. What I'm saying is, I'm sure Slash Filmcast listener Robert will have an opinion on this. I'll be glad to forward it to you when when it comes in. Um, okay, okay. But it's it's interesting hey, you say hey, that. Hey, it's not. It's not. It's, this is not, nothing I say is personal on, towards anyone. <laughs> I'm I'm trying as always. I'm trying to discuss ideas and aesthetics. Not personal. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, it, it is interesting to me that you say that though about movies and how they have subjected us to increasingly ignorant points of view because because uh, I've seen I've seen you praise movies where that that might fall into the categories that you just defined um, Transformers Revenge of the Fallen for example uh, but I, I, I guess it's in the eye of the beholder I think as far as I know none of the Transformers movies are about real human history <laughs> they're all fantasy and well, uh, the last there's, one. A of, there's a lot of leeway in that <laughs> <laughs> the, the last one did rewrite the space race. So. Yes, so yeah. you know a lot of it's, it's a fan. It's a fan. <laughs> I mean, couldn't you say the same about Django as well? No, no I'm not trying no. to compare those two movies. No. It's, it's a, well, <laughs> well, it's, it's a. Of course, Django is a kind of fantasy. My point is that Django is full of cruelty, full of mm-hmm. misrepresentations of of a very painful and tragic American past. That's the that's a difference from the Transformer movies. Yeah, and that's and that's that that difference is important to keep in mind uh, where, you know, one should not be mindless and just say, Oh my, Oh, it's a fantasy, fun, fun, fun. 
ain't fun seeing seeing the human body or a human person degraded. Not fun. This is this is not you know this this is only fun to a juvenile mind, <laughs> or as I say at the end of my review, a reprobated mind. <laughs> I think that 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 you know. This, for, yeah, no, that's. I mean, yeah. again, again, I think, I think it's just it, it's in the eye of the beholder to some degree. But let, let's move on because we we don't have that much time left. Um, let's talk about uh, Zero Dark Thirty. So you released your Better Than list, yes, uh, 2012. This was published on January 9th. Uh, it's called Better Than List 2012, and you you've done this uh, for. I, I certainly remember seeing it last year. I don't know how long the practice has gone on. What, one question before I ask about any specific choices on this list is. Is there a reason you choose to release lists in this way? For example, in a in a better than format. I mean, why not, for example, just list you know your top ten movies for for instance, instead of saying which movies were better than others? Well, I've been doing the better than list, I think, since two thousand five, maybe two thousand six, and I did it because I just I just plain got bored doing a 10 best list <laughs> and and i am and i am bored with other people's 10 best list like who cares <laughs> and, I, and i've certainly i've certainly never done a worse 10 worst list it's like mm-hmm. who, who cares who cares to the 10th power i don't care about that and so uh, but you know <laughs> i'm a journalist too i work for an editor and a publisher and editor and publishers like that kind of thing so back in 2005 or 2006, whichever, I thought, how how can I how can I just how can I you know fulfill my my boss's request uh, without boring myself and my readers? And I thought, well, one thing that I always like to do in my criticism is give people alternate choices, also a way to to make them think about movies rather than mm-hmm. just look at a list of one person's yays or nays, and also to to try to actively employ a sense of uh, movie history, cultural history, I, sense, I, I think, I hope. So that's how I came up with the better than idea. Uh, and the fact is, simply, uh, uh, when I've seen other, other critics, uh, Tim Best List, to me, uh, most critics are shills. Most critics simply like the movies that Hollywood puts in front of them with uh, million-dollar ad campaigns anyway. And I can almost always think of a better film that deserves more attention, <laughs> and so having having a better than list was a way to to attack that problem, as well as uh, give some attention to give some dap, as, as as rappers say, to films that didn't get any dap or respect or attention during the during the movie. Yet. The New York Film Critics so, Circle. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, oh. So, so I'm mean, perfect example to me was that uh, for me the top of the list of the film I like. And, and okay, I'll give away a secret. Whenever I do the better than list, the first film on the list is always the film that I thought was the best film of the year. Ooh. So this this year it's Andre Tichine's Unforgivable, and to me that was certainly a better film than anything else I saw last year. But especially or particularly Zero Dark Thirty, and as I explained in, in my intro to the list and in my little line, my blurb about the the parallel between the, the opposition between Unforgivable and Zero Dark Thirty. Uh, both films deal with politics. Both de- films deal with uh, the human condition in the post-9-11 era. So, to me, they, they were a good pairing. Well, I was going to say, uh, Zero Dark Thirty was, and this is widely reported, it was honored by the New York Film Critics Circle. Uh, yeah, with their, shame. their best film of the year. <laughs> <laughs> your, your old stomping grounds. Uh, and I'm guessing yeah. you, were, you were crestfallen to, to hear this news. A little bit, you know. You know, I'm 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 one of 33 members, 33, 32 members. So you know, one man, one vote, essentially. And and I don't always agree with the group's choices, but I always support the group. I just right. don't agree with the choice this year. But I, I I will say it's a better choice than the year they chose United '93, which was which for me was the low point in the history of the New York Film Critics Circle. Wow. <laughs> no, you you actually you actually. Took two opportunities in your better than list to uh, to put actually down, more like three to, yeah more like three to, to to put down zero dark thirty you um, un- compare it unfor- un- unfavorably to unforgivable but also uh, you claim that Ghost Rider Spirit of Vengeance and Taken Two are both superior to zero dark thirty um, oh yeah so so yeah, yeah I'm curious about that go ahead well for me uh, 
given given the unwarranted hype that has uh, that has, that zero dark thirty has has received, I think you can't uh, <laughs> you can't offer enough alternatives to it. So uh, <laughs> unforgi- unforgivable unforgivable uh, is, is the is the uh, you know the sophisticated humanist alternative, uh, and I think uh, Taken Two and Ghost Rider: Spirit of Gen- Vengeance are the uh, genre and much more political alternatives to Zero Dark Thirty. C- can you explain exactly things. how uh, Ghost Rider and Taken 2 reveal the post-9-11 zeitgeist and genre tropes? Well, okay, I'm going to ask you first. Have you seen both of them? I've seen Taken 2, and I believe Adam has seen Ghost Rider Spirit of Vengeance, right, Adam? No, I've seen Taken 2. Oh, okay, so actually none of us have seen Ghost Rider 2? Uh, oh, you guys, you, oh my God! You got, you got, you got. You <laughs> must always check in on Neville Dean Taylor. <laughs> well, please, we, please. Uh, they, 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 they are, they are great, and they're, they're criminally underrated. Oh, I mean, you, you, Armand, you're speaking with someone who watched Gamer in theaters. So yeah. I, I we're, we're all big fans of the director. We, we are yeah, fans of the response to yeah, Ghost Rider that scared uh, us away. We, we didn't read Armand White's review of Ghost Rider, and so we were <laughs> dissuaded from seeing it in theaters. Unfortunately, ah, you should have seen it uh, because it, you know, it, it uses genre, and uh, Catherine Bigelow is, she, you know, she's a she's a big she's a big genre gal. She likes to work in genre herself. I think Neville Dane Taylor are they're smarter about it. Uh their technique is is more inventive than hers. And and it's called Ghost Rider Spirit of Vengeance. The Spirit of Vengeance is, is an important aspect to understanding American life after nine eleven. And Neville Dane Taylor deal with the idea of vengeance in a in a remarkably moral and and political way. And I think the Zero Dark Thirty never does. Zero Dark Thirty is really unacceptably vague and obscure about politics and morality. And then, so, and also the way that Catherine Bigelow uses her, her interest in genre in Zero Dark Thirty, I think, kind of betrays what it is that genre movies can do. It betrays how genre movies can really take serious political circumstances and heighten them and, and bring them closer to us. I think she keeps everything remote. And and the film becomes, uh, as, as I say in my better than list, it becomes a a kind of mission imp- mission accomplished delusion. As for mission accomplished delusion, that's where Taken Two comes in because Taken Two is it's not simply about uh, vengeance. Uh, it's about the idea of this uh, of the war on terror and how it it's continuous. It seems never to be a mission that can be accomplished. Whereas I think the vagueness of Zero Dark Thirty gives a suggestion that the mission has been accomplished simply with the killing of Osama bin Laden. And do we have time to deal with how the film fails to deal with the killing of Osama bin Laden? Because <laughs> <laughs> there, there the movie is an absolute failure. Well, by not showing it directly? Pardon me? You mean by not showing it directly, or how it was by presented? Not show, by, absolutely by not showing it directly. I mean, who was Catherine Bigelow kidding? And I like her. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I tend to like all of her movies. I've met her, and she's, you know, she's, she's a, she seems to me to be a good and intelligent person. But she's got, she's got, she's got. I'm not, I'm, I'm not joking. I, I, I'm sincere about that. But she's got to get out of this war. Movie. She's got to get out of this war movie rut for one thing, because uh-huh. she already, she already did it as, as good as she can in K-19, The Widowmaker. But she's got to get out of this rut now. The fact that she has to get out of it is proven by Zero Dark Thirty because it just isn't good enough. Who is she kidding? Who is Mark Bowl kidding when they pretend to make a, 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 a highbrow genre film out of the war on terror, out of the killing of Osama bin Laden, and they deny us the pleasure of seeing Osama bin Laden get it? You know, you're, and, and by the way, there are certain reviews of Zero Dark Thirty that pretend that the movie is, is satisfactory on that level. And I argue it absolutely is not satisfactory mm-hmm. to any thinking person, not to any thinking American who was alive during 9-11. Well, I, I would say... If you're, if you're gonna get... For me, that was part of the point, though. Like, I think um, you, you were saying it seems like the movie makes it seem like the mission is accomplished because we yeah. see the killing of Osama bin Laden and there's kind of a sort of finality there. But the fact that we don't see the killing clearly... And also the fact that, you know, at the end, 
I think the audience and also Jessica Chastain's character does feel a certain sense of like uh, aimlessness. Like there is, you know, this goal has been accomplished, but there is still so much more to do and we don't know what to do with ourselves. So I I do think the movie reflects that sort of sensibility as a as a nation. It's it's kind of a strange war movie because it sort of encapsulates everything we've dealt with in the war on terror, but also our complicity in it. I think that's pretty right. that's pretty brave. Chastain, yeah, the, the, go ahead, go ahead, Adam. I was going to say the note the movie like leaves you with is a sense of like what now. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, it's not that's not enough for me. I mean, uh, I'm probably I'm probably older than you guys. <laughs> and, and so I, I've lived through a couple, of, lived through many wars and military engagements. And the question of what now, it's, it's not a question with three asterisks at the end of it. Uh, it's a question that is answered. Uh, you, you keep going. That's what, that's what comes next. And you keep going with definite ideas about how, how to be more human to mm-hmm. yourself and to your former enemy. The, you know, saying what now isn't good enough. And besides, and besides another another. Another important problem failing of Zero Dark Thirty is who is this woman, Maya, played by Jessica Chastain? It's unacceptable to make her a cipher. We need to know who she is. We need to know where she comes from. We need to know what she feels besides what next. Uh, that, that isn't even a character, frankly. Mm-hmm. And that, that's a failing on the filmmaker's part. Uh, she, they, have, they have not given us a character. Even if she's a composite of, of different people, we're watching a movie here. We need to have a character to, to respond to, to identify with or not, but we need to have a character that we can actually think about. I don't know who that girl is, woman. I don't know who she is. Well, I, I, I can agree with that, but I know Devendra disagrees. But yeah, I, I do feel like it's a good example. Then tell, me, then tell me who she is. If you disagree, tell me who she is. I think the movie makes it pretty clear that she is somebody who is all about the mission and all about her work. And from what we, you know, I've been reading about um, the making of the film, there was a single agent who was you know, pretty responsible for – uh, chasing that a uh, single clue for the past decade, and there were other people working with her, but there was one person who was kind of dealing with all of it. And I feel like the movie does a good job of telling us within the action and within just showing us exactly who this character is, how she thinks, and her dedication to the job. So, but that's yeah, just ab- abandoning all it. semblance of like a social yeah. life in order to accomplish this thing, and. In terms of like her arc throughout the film, I feel like that question of like what now that the movie leaves you with is actually pretty vital because it leaves you with the sense of like this woman that you've spent all this time with throughout ten years trying to achieve something, and then like what did she really achieve? Like what was the point of all this? Yeah, um, and I feel like that. So that question of like what now it kind of just lingers, and you, you can answer it certainly, but I feel like the fact that the movie like leaves you with that to think about is is mm-hmm. pretty important. Yeah, and compared to other wars, too, like, uh, let me just say, other wars ended, right? The Vietnam War ended. Um, The War on Terror, who knows what's going on here? Who knows when this will ever end? It's so more amorphous and uh, sort of just, yeah, it's inconclusive compared to everything else we felt before. Kind of funny how the movie, you know, sort of resembled that. You can't make an inconclusive movie. If you're making a movie, you have to be definite about things, and you need to be definite about your protagonist. Otherwise, she's not a human being. She's an automaton. She, mm-hmm. has a, she ought to have a history. She ought to have beliefs. She ought to have politics. Uh, this is how you create a character. This is why, this is why you guys and, and all movie lovers everywhere should see Tashine's Unforgivable, because human beings are complex, and... <laughs> she needs to be, she's not complex she's a cipher that won't do that won't do that won't do an art it needs to be better okay well this too- otherwise the facetious concept of zero dark 30 uh, well otherwise zero dark 30 just leaves us with its facetious con, con concept and it's proud of itself for that it's not enough fellows it's not enough uh, look at grand illusion <laughs> it's not enough Look at Bridge on the River Kwai. It's not enough. Look at Lawrence of Arabia. It's not enough. We need to know who these characters are. Could there have been a more enigmatic, seemingly a more seemingly enigmatic person, character in the history of movies than T. E. Lawrence? Look how how David Lean and Peter O'Toole fleshed him out. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's how that's how you make a character. That's how you make art. That's how you make a great movie. 
zero dark thirty ain't it. Well, let's, uh, there's two separate arguments you're making there, Armand. One of them is about the character, which I agree with, Devinger and Adam don't agree with, that's fine. But putting that aside, um, this whole notion of uh, you can't have a movie leave, uh, you, you can't have a movie end unresolved like that, um, can, can you expand on that a little bit more? Like, w- what is your issue with that, that idea of a movie not resolving in a way that you'd prefer in this situation? Well, I mean, it's just uh, Sam Peckinpah's Straw Dogs uh, in mm-hmm. uh, the David Warner character telling Dustin Hoffman, I think, telling him to take him home or something like that, and or I'm, I'm, I'm messing this up now. But, uh, but as I recall, the Peckinpah's Straw Dogs ends with the idea of going home, and somebody says, I don't know where that is. That's not inconclusive. That's not vague. That's that. That's identifying a real moral and social problem. And zero dark thirty doesn't end that way. Zero dark thirty plays with our, plays with the mess we are in with the war on terror, and it doesn't resolve it. It doesn't. And I'm not saying that it has to give answers to the war on terror, but mm-hmm. but for the two and a half hours that Catherine Bigelow wants us to pay attention to her, she needs to give us something definite. She needs to give us a clearer sense of how human beings behave and think, not just end, us on, end on a vague note. Uh, Straw Dogs does not end on a vague note. Straw Dogs ends with a moral question, and Zero Dark Thirty doesn't do that. I don't know. I would, I would disagree with that yeah. last notion about Zero Dark Thirty not ending with a moral question. I mean, it, it couldn't conceivably the moral question be, was it worth it? Do you, do you not do you a not think that that is a plausible moral question that that movie ends with, or b not think that that is an important question? I don't think it, I don't think it poses that question. <laughs> Interesting. Um, I mean, I, I think the the look on Chastain's face as the plane is pulling out of the uh, out of the air, you know, the, the mm-hmm. runway, seems to seems to imply that she is considering whether or not this was worth committing you know, over a decade of her life to, and whether it was worth all the moral compromises that she had to engage in. Yeah. And, and the oh. way the workmanlike way that the raid on the uh, Bin Laden compound is played out, you know, it's very slow, but by the time you see so many soldiers going into a compound where they really have no resistance, it's sort of like a massacre. Um, it's really interesting how that movie makes you feel like, oh, wait, these are the good guys. Is all of this worth it to kill this one man? It's called war, Catherine. That's what war is. War is war is not a drug, as she falsely suggested in her father. <laughs> That's what war is. You know, you go and get the enemy, or else the enemy will get you. Catherine, go look at Patton. Gee, <laughs> but that's what war is. Let's not let's not get confused with the, after you know because of nine eleven about about what war is, what politics mm-hmm. are, and how human beings be and how soldiers behave. If you become a soldier, and even if you're a CIA agent, you are a soldier. Uh, there are certain things you are pledged to do, certain things you believe in doing, or else you don't do that job. And the movie, this movie doesn't make it clear. It certainly doesn't make it clear if it wants to end on a vague note. And by the way, what is that vague note when throughout the movie she talks about she feels, she, she feels that she was, she was spared for this mission, where she, where she mentions being uh, hurt because she's lost so many friends. What friends? <laughs> During this search, this hunt, this manhunt. Uh, and, and that, 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 <laughs> Well, that, that, that was a particularly bizarre moment where she talks about she feels that she was spared for this mission. And, and then, of course, you know, the funny moment where she tells the Leon Panetta figure uh, that she is the MF <laughs> who brought this information to light. I mean, this, she, she then must be a committed soldier, not someone who doesn't know what she's doing or what she's going to do next. That's crap. Mm-hmm. That's crap. But- that, that, and that, 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 that's where Catherine Bigelow... Is playing, trying to play to both sides of the audience. I think, uh, you know, hawks and doves. And it's it's funny do. though. D- doesn't that if if you know soldiers were just blindly following orders, doesn't that make them the automatons you were worried about? Uh, Chastain's character. No, no, I feel not, like not, the humanist ideas is them kind of reflecting on their duties. An automaton has no feelings, makes no choices. Soldiers make a choice, and that that and that, by the way, in our in our unfortunately. Uh, lily-livered liberal era is what many people don't understand or respect about the military. Soldiers make a choice. And the choice is the basis of, of what makes a soldier's sacrifice noble. Um, mm-hmm. Those are the things you have to deal with. 
prob- probably the post Vietnam era filmmaker uh, is so a- so rabidly anti military that they don't understand these things. And in the years since Vietnam, we have audiences who don't understand these things either. And, and our lily livered liberal filmmakers are no help. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's funny I, that, yeah, because this movie is getting also flamed because people assume it uh, promotes torture. So I don't like there's a certain amount of liberalism here. But, yeah, it's also getting bl- uh, flamed by the liberals for not you know yeah. saying anything specifically. I mean, what, what do they want? What do they want? I mean, you know, if we, if we got liberties, uh, they're paid for with freedom is paid for with a price. I forget who said that, but it's true. Mm-hmm. Can't forget that price. Liberals want to think that you know <laughs> that we have our liberties because we live in a world of daisies, <laughs> daisies and sunshine. No, 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 no. So I take it you're more of a conservative, Arvind. Is that is that accurate? Or I I, I identify to no label, no political label. I'm I, Arvind. I'm, I'm I'm trying to think things through for myself all the time. All right, all right. Well, I mean, I I'll, I'll let you have the last word. I mean, I I guess I would argue that. You were you were saying, oh, watch Patton, you know, or watch another war movie. Like war, wars are a certain way, and what I think what Davinder was trying to say earlier is that one could argue that the the war on terror is a qualitatively different type of war uh, that forces us to reconfigure our assumptions about what a, a beginning and an end of a war is, how we comport ourselves in the in a war, um, and that some of these ambiguities. Are reflected quite effectively in Zero Dark Thirty, um, but I, I guess well, you, you don't agree with that. I, I, I have to disagree. I, I think it's just uh, that's political pundit uh, uh, hype. <laughs> that's that's political pundit. Uh, it's a political pundit canard. Uh, war is war. Uh, right. I mean. Uh, Old wars ended. This war will be ongoing, and I don't know how we'll ever see how it will end. That's the big problem. Well, you know, it you know depends on who you're talking to, because uh, there are pundits and, and political theorists who could tell you that uh, some wars never end, uh, such as what, what we used to call the Cold War. Yep. It just you know it just goes into different phases, uh, and so and so. You know, there's, there's not my point is that there's nothing different about the war on terror, really, in, in, in military terms, in in terms of diplomacy or in, in, in politics. It's not different. That's just Sunday afternoon TV talk show hype. <laughs> all, all right. Well, I think we've we've strayed a little bit far from the movie at this point, but I I do uh, thank you very much for your time, Armin. I mean, I think it's always fascinating to have you on. Um, and uh, I'm sorry. I, go ahead. I appreciate you having me on, hearing me out, and, and and I don't know how it sounded, but I enjoy talking about it with you guys. Oh, it's always fun. We always yeah. we yeah, always absolutely. love having you on. Uh, we'd love to get you on again sometime. You know, hopefully a couple times in 2013 if you're if you're open to that idea. I'm um, open. I'm open. All right. Well, Armand White. I also just wanted to say that I, I appreciate your dismissal of Compliance, which I, I also thought was a <laughs> terrible movie. Oh yeah, wasn't that a, wasn't that awful? <laughs> yeah, it truly was. <laughs> yeah. Well, in any case, Armand White is a film critic who writes for City Arts. Uh, he's a former chair of the New York Film Critics Circle, and he's the author of Keep Moving: The Michael Jackson Chronicles. Armand White, thanks again for joining us today. Really appreciate your time. 